In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Do you remember when you were a child how long every period of time seemed? I have a vivid memory of Christmas 1958, not Christmas Day itself, but rather waking up on Boxing Day filled with the deepest woe because it would be a whole year, an unimaginable eon before it would be Christmas again. I was four years old and I can still feel the anguish of that day. The years of childhood rolled on so slowly, it seemed. I remember longing and longing to be 12 years old, which seemed like an age of immense dignity. Then finally becoming that magic thing, a teenager, and waiting and waiting for the day when at 16, I could get a provisional driver's license, which is a real rite of passage for American teenagers, I can tell you. And I wept for hours because my birthday fell on a Saturday that year and the office was closed and I had to wait an extra 48 hours before I could get behind the wheel. It seemed so unfair. Then it was waiting to be old enough to leave home for university and independent travel and all the rest of the new experiences of young adulthood. Everything took so long. Why does time go by at such different rates for young and old people. Why does a Friday afternoon in school on a summer's day last for years, while a week's holiday in middle age is over in the blink of an eye? Adrian Bejan, a professor of mechanical engineering at Duke University, explains why time flies as we age. He says all systems tend to evolve towards easier access to flow, including the way we horizontally scan our surroundings. So we start off in life by concentrating hard on all the visual stimuli around us. The eyes of my three-month-old granddaughter are constantly moving as they scan the world and process what they see. She is learning and absorbing new things every minute that she is awake. Her day is filled with visual information that needs to be stored and digested. But the rate of visual processing slows down as we grow up, and it's much slower by the time we reach old age. Professor Bejan writes that like a film strip, the more frames we see in a second, the more slowly the image seems to pass. The children see a lot of frames per second. When there are fewer frames, the image moves faster. As our brains age, our memory lays down fewer frames per second. When children remember the passage of time, they can recall far more visual data than adults can. So looking back, our childhood seems to have been long and filled with things whereas we can sometimes barely remember last year. Mind time is not the same as clock time, which can be measured objectively. Mental time depends on memory, and that's largely fed by that succession of visual images, though, of course, other senses are also involved, as Marcel Proust well knew, often a smell or a taste can transport us instantly back to a time in our early life, and we can recapture vividly an experience of decades ago when time seemed to stand still. As we get older and realize that our personal span is limited, mental time definitely goes by faster. We know we're heading towards an ending. No one wants to reach the point of mental or physical incapacity or indeed of death itself. We like things as they are. We may not wish to return to the interminable waiting around that we remember from childhood, but we'd settle happily for the sense of time passing at a comfortable trot in our early adulthood. More of the same, please, might well be our prayer. We're not in a hurry to reach the finishing line. The rich fool in the parable that Jesus told felt like this. His prudent concern was to pile up earthly treasure for tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, 
He seemed to think that the bigger his barn, the longer his life would be. Surely his time wouldn't run out until he had used up all the wealth he had so carefully accumulated. He just wanted more of the same to go on and on. If only he had read Ecclesiastes more carefully. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. Or indeed, today's Psalm 49, for he seeth that wise men also die and perish together as well as the ignorant and foolish and leave their riches for other. Our time will run out, we don't know when, and our earthly possessions will then be of no value to us. Future generations will take our place. That's the sobering message of three of the readings we've heard this morning. Vanity, all is vanity. But then look at Paul's letter to the Colossians. He writes to those early Christians, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Not you will die like all human beings, but you have already died. The resurrection, he tells them, is here and now. And because we are united through our baptism with the death and rising of Christ, we have already entered into the life that never ends. This is the good news we need to share, that life in Christ takes us out of that endless rat race, when like the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, we're constantly worried about where we're going and how much time we need in order to get there. The mystery of time is complicated. On the one hand, as we experience it, time seems to go by faster and faster, leading only to death. But God's time is now. In the present moment, in which our life is already hidden with Christ in God, we have leapfrogged over that looming turnstile. Instead of rushing forever onwards in a hopeless attempt to hang on to our body and our possessions, we can relax because the resurrection has already taken place. So we can experience timelessness and peace in every single moment. I spent part of last weekend at a camp for singers of the American shape note music tradition that I'm so fond of uh, joining in with. And I was asked at that camp to lead a class on why singing about mortality matters. Most of the songs in shape note books are set to texts that focus on death. You could equally well say that they are songs about time, about the limits within which we live and the speed with which our time on earth passes. And yet those songs are a joy to sing. Those frontiers men and women, leading their hard scrabble lives, cheered themselves up with jolly songs about traveling to the grave. What the songs teach us is to live in full awareness and thankfulness in the present moment. We cannot know how much time we have left, but we can live today as if it is forever in the knowledge that eternity has already taken hold of us through the risen Christ. To speak personally for a moment, the knowledge that retirement is looming is a gentle reminder of my own mortality. All things must pass, even the joy of living and working in Primrose Hill among people I love. But the awareness of how limited my time is here serves to heighten my appreciation of this place, this season, and this fellowship. And I need to apply this practice of the sacrament of the present moment to all of life. That is the spiritual task of all of us, especially as we get older. It doesn't stop us from remembering the past with gratitude, and in some instances, regret. It may seem unbelievable that so much time has flown by, but we remember the rich texture of experiences in our childhood. We can recapture the sense of all the time in the world before us and all the possibilities. Perhaps we can relive the sense that time was moving much too slowly then. 
And living in the present moment doesn't stop us either from imagining the future. At a time of climate crisis, it's vitally important that we look towards a time when we will be gone, but the consequences of our lifestyles now will have a profound effect on the planet. Like many others, I'm sure it's the recent experience of becoming a grandparent that has stretched my horizon forward significantly. I feel that I now have a personal stake in the 22nd century. Our present behavior must be shaped by how it will affect future generations. But though it's a natural pleasure to remember the past and be thankful, and it's a vital discipline to look forward to the future and make provision, the place where we encounter God is always now. We can, with practice, always experience the reality of God's presence and grace in the present moment. That is a foretaste of what eternity means. Amen.